Hi there, and welcome back to History and Philosophy of Science and Medicine. I'm Matt Brown. Today we're going to be talking about Paul Feyerabend and his book Against Method. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about what the scientific method is, uh, or if there is such a thing. Uh, we're also going to talk about um, the Galileo case uh, and the Copernican Revolution uh, to, to some degree. Now. Um, a little bit first about Paul Feyerabend. Feyerabend was born in 1924 in Vienna. Um, growing up uh, as a young man, his academic interests were in physics and astronomy, but he was also quite interested in theater and in, uh, and in music. Um, and he had a, uh, reportedly had a great singing voice um, and uh, sort of spent a lot of his, his young life trying to figure out if his direction was going to be um, scientific or, or artistic. Um, and in the end, of course, as we know, he ended up in philosophy of science, uh, which perhaps is a middle ground. Um, now, uh, while Feyerabend was a college student, um, uh, the Nazis rose to power in Germany, and after the German occupation of Austria, um, Feyerabend was drafted into the Nazi work service, um, Feyerabend uh, uh, subsequently ended up, uh, during World War II, volunteering for officer school, not on his own account because he had any particular um, ideological uh, or even nationalistic commitment to the German cause, but uh, simply because he thought officer school would take so long that the war would be over by the time he had graduated. That's not what happened, and he did see uh, fighting. Uh, he, fought on the, he fought on the German side on the Eastern Front, that is against Russia, um, and he was wounded in battle. Uh, shot, uh, a bullet lodged in his spine. Um, he was temporarily paralyzed and uh, permanently disabled by the, by the wound. Um, he uh, ended up, uh, as I said, uh, pursuing uh, graduate work in philosophy, um, in he, so he worked in philosophy of science and philosophy of physics originally. Um, he uh, was very much influenced by the work of Ludwig Wittgenstein and Karl Popper. Ended up working with Popper uh, in England at the London School of Economics for a while. Um, and then spent much of his career um, at the University of California at Berkeley, um, as well as um, uh, taking appointments in various European universities as well. So let's talk a little bit about this book, uh, Against Method, um, which is what you read the first several chapters of for today. Um, Against Method was originally conceived of as a dialogue volume. So Feyerabend had written a long essay called Against Method, an outline of an anarchistic theory of knowledge in 1970. And on the basis of that, a friend of his, uh, another philosopher of science and follower of Karl Popper named Imre Lakatos, uh, wrote to him and said, well, you have such interesting, strange ideas, let's write a debate volume. So Feyerabend would write a, a section against method, against the notion of a scientific method, and Lakatos would write a section for method, um, uh, in favor of the scientific method, and they would publish it as for and against scientific method. Now, um, Unfortunately, in the midst of writing this, uh, Lakatos died. His part was not completed. And um, uh, as a result, Feyerabend ended up publishing against Method as a, sole, as a solo volume. Um, and it became his most defining work. The original version came out in 1975. He published uh, a second edition in 1987. And the final third edition he published in uh, 1993, and then uh, a few years ago, uh, they uh, reprinted the book in a fourth edition with an introduction by Ian Hacking. Um, so uh, the book 
you know, it has this kind of, um, it takes a kind of extreme side, in part because it was supposed to be paired with an alternative view. Um, it is dialogical in nature. You know, some of you have pointed out there's this long, confusing footnotes in the book, but I think they're in, t in part an attempt to kind of fill in the dialogue uh, a little bit. Um, also, they're a result of the multiple stages of, of revision and Fire Robin's own somewhat ex eccentric eccentric um, writing style, uh, which involves um, a kind of nonlinear thinking as well as uh, very many references to things that, that the audience might not have been familiar with, so it require a little bit of explanation. So um, that's sort of the origin of the book. Um, uh, in the book, he takes the position uh, that there is no common structure to the various things that we call science or the sciences. Um, there is no one single scientific method at work. And the, meth and the, and the writing style or the, the argument style of the book uh, has, has two parts. On the one hand, it is historical. So Feyerabend integrates history and philo into the philosophy of science to make this argument that there is no single scientific method. Um, and it's also, uh, it also has an abstract philosophical element to it. So he argues, you know, normatively speaking against the idea of any binding uh, scientific method. Um, the famous phrase from the book, anything goes, is a kind of tongue-in-cheek expression of this view, where he says, look, if you want a single principle that can govern all of science, there's only one principle that could possibly satisfy you and be true to, uh, and be true to science and not restrict science from doing what it needs to do, and that's the principle, anything goes. Right? Not that he's, re he's literally recommending anything goes, Rather, he's recommending a, a kind of open-ended uh, methodological pluralism about science. Now, um, the, the, uh, let me say a little bit more about the historical side of, of the method here, uh, or, the, or the historical side of the argument here. Um, Feyerabend doesn't just think you can conclude from the basis of some historical thing that scientists have done, that that's a good way to do science. No, that's, that's, that argument doesn't work for him. Um, instead, what he does is he takes, uh, he takes cases that anyone he thinks would agree, any sort of um, uh, defender of the scientific method would agree, are cases of, of science, exemplary science in action. And he says, uh, look, these violate the method that you want to defend. Right, and that's why uh, Feyerabend, you know, thinks the history actually has some some bite on a philosophical account. It says, "Look, uh, if you had if you had your way, methodologically speaking, you would rule out these important uh, landmark achievements in science." And the one he talks about the most in the book is the case of Galileo. Um, in order to make this case, he do, he makes kind of two. There's kind of, in this first part, there are two big lines of argument he runs. So um, nothing could maybe be, could seem less controversial in terms of the scientific method than the idea that, um, look, new scientific theories should be um, consistent with the past results, right? With well-established results. He takes this in two directions. He says, uh, on the one hand, it might mean that new theory needs to be, in some broad sense, logically consistent with uh, prior, well-confirmed scientific theories. So scientific theories with lots of evidence behind them. Um, and number two, that new theories need to be consistent with well-established facts, with well-established um, observational or experimental results, right? Um, he says, you know, he's, he asks, well, what would the, what would the opposite of those, what would, what would a method that violated those uh, principles look like? And he calls that method counter-induction or counter-inductive method. So a counter-inductive method would either um, 
uh, posit new ideas that are logically inconsistent with well-established theories, or uh, it would posit theories that are inconsistent with um, established scientific results, right? Um, and his argument is that, uh, that this counter-inductive method is exemplified by uh, the things that Galileo does in his work. Now you might think, well, you know, how dare Feyerabend try to impugn the reputation of Galileo? Galileo is a, a, a key figure in the scientific revolution. But that's not Feyerabend's point at all. Feyerabend doesn't mean to say that Galileo's work is suspect or problematic. Rather, he's attempting to show that by the lights of a theory of scientific method, by the kind of what he calls rationalist account of how science works, Galileo would be so, Galileo would be so impugned. Galileo would be so impugned by such a method. Um, he agrees with you that Galileo is in fact a good scientist, and therefore the, he thinks this provides us an argument that, that you too ought to accept, anybody, any defender of scientific method ought to accept, that uh, these methodological rules or restrictions are, are suspect, right? Um, and so that's, that's the purpose of that kind of historical argument. Now you might think that's pretty problematic, right? Because uh, Feyerabend is saying, you know, in order to make progress, like we see in the Galileo case, science needs to pre proceed uh, without these methodological restrictions. But um, what kind of concept of progress are you going to assume if you don't think that um, science has to be consistent with what's come before, right? This is like the Kuhn problem, where you have radical change from one paradigm to the next, but instead of happening you know, in these rare occasions of scientific revolutions, it's happening all the time, constantly in science. Well, Feyerabend does have a couple of things to say about this. On the one hand, he tells us, look, um, I'm not going to give you a, a theory of progress. Use whatever theory of progress you're already committed to. The point I'm making is that if, according to your theory of progress, probably cases like Galileo are cases of, of, of making forward motion. Um, uh, that is, they're, they're cases of progress. Um, um, on your own account, to make that progress, uh, we, have, we had to proceed in that case counterinductively. Right? Um, so that's one thing he says. Um, and I think we can see this as a kind of imminent or internal critique, right? He's not, he's not so much propounding his own new philosophical method or philosophical system. He's going within the assumptions of the views he's criticizing and using the commitments there. Um, on the other hand, he does, uh, in a few places, uh, say some things that, that maybe um, indicate what his own view would be. And it seems there, when he's thinking about scientific progress, he's not so much thinking about an abstract notion of progress of knowledge, the growth of our knowledge. He's really thinking about um, scientific progress being linked to, to human progress, right? To the growth of our, um, our human capacities. He's not so much thinking about progress as narrowly defined scientific progress, he's thinking about progress as, as human progress, as, as improvement in uh, human sort of capabilities, um, in, in human knowledge, consciousness, um, and the betterment of society, perhaps. So those are some of the key ideas I want you to take away uh, from the book Against Method um, and the first uh, seven chapters or so. Um, and, uh, of course, we'll, we'll continue the discussion as he develops the, uh, the example of Galileo further and starts to unpack some further consequences of his argument um, and address some further considerations uh, next week. Um, if you have any uh, questions uh, about what I've said today, please, uh, or, or comments or concerns, you know, please raise, uh, raise them in our uh, discussion forum or on Discord or leave a comment here on the video. I look forward to continuing the conversation with you, and I will uh, see you next week.